Good morning. And as usual, Indigo on time. Thank you. It was a very insightful speech. A lot more that we can get to know about Indigo and uh, your help to India. So thank you so much. So now, uh, when I was given the opportunity, first of all, a big thanks for uh, getting me here to uh, in front of uh, bright youngsters, you know, to talk about my journey and the journey as we disrupt, you know, in the healthcare space. Uh, so I can tell you one thing, you know, GenWorks itself is a, is a disruption. And, uh, you know, I can tell you for sure, I'm the one who is embracing this, uh, you know, disruption, you know, for democratizing healthcare. So, and I'll tell you how in the next uh, 40 minutes. Now, all of us know healthcare is essential. You know, there's nothing about healthcare, you know, that it, it, it's only available to a set of people and not avail to, available to the rest. So, at this point, you know, it's underserved. And definitely, in the tie two, tie three geogra geographies of our country, it truly is underserved. And uh, it's underserved not because uh, of any other reason other than the fact that, you know, uh, we don't have, uh, you know, specialists in most of these geographies. We don't have access to reliable quality te and affordable technologies in most of the geographies. And uh, we can keep complaining about this all our life. And that's, this is when, you know, GE decided to disrupt. Ten years ago, uh, GE Healthcare, you know, I'm a very long tenured, uh, you know, GE employee for many years before I moved into GenWorks. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, GE made the decision uh, to change its outlook to markets as in India. And uh, in fact, uh, they did it by, you know, stating a mission, uh, restating their mission, uh, you know, to be at work for healthier India. And when they, when they said that, the first thing they did was to look at you know, the technologies that we have and using those technologies and, you know, innovating to make sure that, you know, we have the best in class technologies available at a price that is affordable. That was the first step. The first step was to bring uh, products at the level of quality, you know, that GE is expected to deliver at affordable prices. And they did it by, not by cutting costs, they did it by creating relevance relevance to markets, relevance to provide access, uh, you know, to a lot of physicians is the first thing that they did. And when they did that, uh, they brought in a lot of products which were made in India for the world. And, uh, but still, these products were only going to the Metro and Tyrone customers because our distribution was limited to the Metro Tyrone customers. And we had, of course, distributors who were small in scale but, uh, you know, not sustainable distribution who could make an effort to go and uh, get customers to adopt technology. So, uh, five years back, there was a decision taken by our CEO, uh, Terry Brashenham, uh, to create an innovation in distribution. And uh, through the disruption that she wanted to make uh, healthcare affordable for all, she created GenWorks. Uh, invested company of GE and uh, asked me to lead it. And if you want to know why I was asked to lead it, I can tell you one thing in GE, for a lot of people who want to join GE, I can tell you one thing is a surety for you. Any good work is definitely punished with more work. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a reasonably good tenure in GE, a successful tenure in GE, and they asked me to lead this challenge. And when I'm given a chance to lead, I, I mean, I, 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 I uh, take in a lot of people along with me. I brought in a lot of people. Uh, one of them is here. So we uh, created a company called GenWorks. 60 of us uh, moved to GenWorks from GE. And, uh, you know, we uh, are now 350 people in the last four years. So now that's a small brief of what is GenWorks and what we are doing, you know, to embrace disruption to democratize healthcare. And because healthcare has to be universal. It cannot be uh, for a few who are lucky. And uh, even for the few who are lucky, uh, how efficient it is, is a factor. For some, it's available. 
and for those who are available in our country, how efficient it is. And when I say efficiency, uh, it has to provide early care, it has to be affordable, and uh, it has to get you back to normal life very soon. And you know that's the responsibility of delivery of health care. And uh, this is how, and most of you know this, uh, this is how healthcare is. It truly is a personal experience for all of us. And uh, I'll share with you some interesting personal experiences as well in my journey, not, just, not, not necessarily in the uh, organization where I work for, but also my own personal experiences. You know, because I deal with healthcare and I have to be, uh, I mean, even at home, I have to take care of healthcare of me and for my family. So look at uh, you know healthcare in its perspective. You know healthcare is delivered in clinics, in hospitals. It's delivered by specialists. It's got diagnosis as an element. It's got monitoring as an element. It's got treatment as an element. You know all of this have to come together, and all of this has to come together to make it effective and efficient. I'll share with you a, a few personal examples. Not long ago. <laughs> It was about 25 years back. I had a personal experience. Uh, well, there's been a lot of great uh, help that I have had uh, through the healthcare delivery system in the country. Uh, but there are a few which I want to bring out for you to, you know, just connect to, you know, what's needed to be done to truly make it transformational. To truly, because when we democratize healthcare, you know, we are going to create a lot more as a problem to solve and uh, because the net is going to be wider and uh, we need to really focus on you know not just you know going and selling products or building hospitals or building nursing homes or building physician offices it's also about how effi efficiently we should deliver in that context i thought my personal stories would truly really help 25 years back i was in the healthcare i just started uh, I think I was a few years, uh, three, four years in my career. I mean, all my life I was in healthcare. And uh, I was sitting in the office after lunch, after a good lunch, and suddenly I had a chest pain. Uh, I was 26 at that time. Chest pain, radiating the left arm, you know, uh, with my whatever knowledge I had of healthcare was scary. So I turned around and I told my colleague, I'm having this. And obviously, <laughs> he was concerned, and uh, I was rushed to a reasonably good big hospital those days near our office. I was immediately sent to the emergency. Uh, they took a ECG. ECG has been an electrocardiogram, which looks at uh, how your heart functions. That's the first thing you do when you have a chest pain, or if you want to have a look at how healthy your heart is. I was taken to the emergency. The ECG was performed on me. And uh, I could hear them saying something. I could hear them saying that uh, left bundle branch block, you know, was what was seen through the artificial intelligence that was provided those days by those equipment providers. And uh, even in the metro, I was, it was in Chennai. Even in metro, I was in the heart of the city 25 years back. You know, uh, there was no specialist available in the hospital 24 by 7. There was a duty doctor who was a youngster, was learning, and I would not fault him at all. He did what best he could do. But I was diagnosed to be, you know, having a myocardial infarction. And uh, I was put immediately through a thrombolization. And, you know, I was in the ICU. Before the specialist came in, uh, much later, you know, all this what I said happened around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The cardiologist came in at uh, 10, 10.30, and when he came for rounds, he uh, did an echo, uh, echocardiography, and uh, he looked at the reports, and he said, it's, it's fine. Why did he have to go through all this? And just look at the <laughs> emotional trauma, a 26-year-old, uh, my daughter's naming, my first daughter's naming had to be in the, in the same week, a few days ahead, and uh, had to go through this. And thankfully, the cardiologist came in, and uh, he got me out of everything. 
uh, put me on a treadmill and on a Bruce protocol, which is a difficult to do treadmill. I'm, I'm sure most of you guys do it anyway in your <laughs> gyms, uh, you know, today. I had to go through this. Why? Was there not a hospital? Yes, there was a good hospital. Yes, there were specialists. Yes, there were equipment. Yes, there were even equipment which could give interpretation in those days. But a collective judgment and ability for a specialist to have a look even when he's not there and get, stay connected to the patient, not just rely on what was available as you know, the resources there was a problem. Thankfully, you know, I got out of it. And, uh, you know, even 15 days back, I did a treadmill, and they still say my heart is healthy. <laughs> so, thank, so that's how, you know, that's one personal experience. I'm just saying these stories just for you to have a connect as to how and why. It's not just about expanding healthcare access. It's not about, you know, expanding technology adoption. It's about how we optimize and make delivery efficient is the key. I'll tell you another experience which happened five years later. Uh, we were all having dinner at home, and uh, my mother suddenly, uh, you know, fainted. And uh, we were worried, and she got up by herself within a few minutes, and uh, we took her to the neighborhood uh, clinic. Uh, ideally, an ECG should have been performed on her. Uh, there was no technology, they didn't have an ECG machine. And instead of asking for an ECG, the doctor decided to treat uh, to eat on a more conservative basis. And uh, we came back and had to rush her to the hospital because, uh, and then we came to know that she had a heart block. Because we took her late, you know, she had to go through further complications and had to struggle for six months in the hospital and then she passed away. We look at a scenario as this. We face this every day. We face this every day. This is a physician in the heart of the city. Uh, when we went with a problem, and can we say, can we comfort ourselves saying that you're not lucky? You would not, and I was in the healthcare industry. And even recently, I can tell you, while this problem to a large extent is solved over the last 20, 25 years in the metros, my dad lives in a village, not far away, 70 kilometers from Chennai. And around 1 o'clock in the night, you know, he uh, called me and said that he's feeling breathless. And uh, immediately we rushed him to the nearby hospital in Kanjipuram, a 24 by 7 uh, hospital. And, uh, you know, I was in Bangalore. I had to, I needed five hours to reach. Indigo does not operate midnight, so I did not have the luxury of <laughs> taking the flight midnight. I had to go the next day morning or use uh, none of the airlines operate at midnight, so I'm not blaming Indigo here. So, but when I asked them what they said, they said, no, he's in a very serious condition. My brother used to work in Malaysia. They said uh, he's in a very serious condition, acute MI, and uh, uh, they did an ECG. They said it's an acute MI, and uh, they said, please inform relatives. We are we're trying to stabilize him. And when I sent an ambulance, thanks to my friend uh, who runs a hospital in Chennai, a leading hospital in Chennai. He was brought back, he was brought to Chennai, and they said, it didn't seem like an MI. Then, uh, it's just because you know he was 75 years, they had to put, put him through a lot of tests, including the angiogram, and everything was fine. For a 75 year old, his heart was very, very healthy. There's no block anywhere. And uh, you know, what was the diagnosis? The diagnosis was sleep apnea. It's because he had an obstructive airway disease. He couldn't sleep well and for many days. And then uh, probably that at his age with a little bit of uh, nervousness, he stays alone with uh, servants because I'm in Bangalore and he's there. And why I'm saying all these three things is one, when you have access to an hospital, when you don't have specialists, you know, you still are not lucky. You may have technology, you may be in a hospital. If you don't have the specialist around, it's a problem. So if you really see the issues that we face today in healthcare, is about late or incorrect diagnosis. It's about 
affordability, because when we rush at the time of treatment, you know, it certainly is unaffordable. Uh, availability of specialists round the clock. Even in the best of the hospitals, availability of specialists round the clock is a problem. And in the tier two, tier three towns, availability of specialists itself is a problem because specialists are more. 80% of uh, the specialists are available in the 20% of the geography. So there's a problem that we need to face. And uh, of course, availability of access to diagnostics and uh, you know, monitoring technology. So now all of this being there, if I need to broad-based healthcare, if I have to look at democratization of healthcare, you now Prime Minister is doing it through Ashman Bharat program. This is the first step you know, to democratize healthcare and improve healthcare access. If we don't correct this, we're going to be in for more trouble. So that's where GenWorks uh, or the GE's decision to create an organization called GenWorks makes a big difference because our fundamental focus over the last four years has been to improve in each of this area. We have been trying to increase technology adoption in clinics. We are trying to leverage the cloud and the internet to be able to connect specialists 24 by 7 through hub centers who can you know, read and report and also guide uh, you know, uh, the hospital to manage the patients efficiently. We are through a lot of education programs, you know, in, in improving, you know, uh, knowledge, knowledge levels, uh, not just at the level of specialists, at the level of, you know, doctors, at the level of paramedical staff, and everyone in the system, you know, who's in touch with the patient, you know, when he's in, when he's in dire need. Uh, we are promoting very, very actively early intervention. I'll tell you how uh, as we move on. And it's all about enabling technology. My personal belief is technology should not make healthcare cost more. Technology should make healthcare cost less. And that can only happen through connected healthcare. And I'll explain you how or what we've been doing about it. We believe in liquefying expertise because specialist is scarce. You know, we need uh, specialists are available in limited geography. Thankfully, internet can connect them. Uh, our mobile devices can connect them. When we connect the devices to the equipment, the mobile devices to the equipment, you know, we'll be able to have 24 by 7 access to specialists. And of course, I fundamentally believe uh, digitalization and, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, as it evolves, I won't say at this point in time, but as it evolves, is going to be a big help. So just to give you a context, you know, I gave you a personal context. But the large statistics, you know, we deliver about 30 million babies every year. Our infant mortality rates and our maternal mortality rates are one of the highest. It's coming down, definitely. A lot of efforts by the government, initiated by the government for institutional deliveries, is really getting, you know, these down. But infusion of technology, training, ability to intervene early, you know, move from treatment mindset that we are all set to a screening mindset right from the time the baby is born, as it grows, for the mother when she is pregnant. All of this is really going to make the change. Uh, you know, our problem remains, as we say that, you know, as we want to expand healthcare, our problem remains compared to the world median, you know, the number of physicians we have for the population is less. And uh, that also drives the number of uh, paramedical staff we have is less. And that also drives the number of hospital beds. Now, every hospital bed is expensive. And it needs specialists. It needs paramedical staff. It's a complete ecosystem. Now, can we do something leveraging technology to disrupt this? Can we bring in a little bit of home health? Can we, by early health, can we, not, can we avoid the emergencies? And, uh, you know, uh, the visits to the uh, ICUs are things that we are trying to change as we progress. So fundamentally, it's all about this. We have everything, and we have the patients, and how do we connect everything? Efficiency will come in only if we have connected healthcare. And I told you about my problem. If only, just uh, look at it as what I said, if 
only there was 25 years back an ability to connect my ECG to the cardiologist who came in much later. I could have been avoided, uh, saved of the, you know, thrombolization or the ICU admission because you would have seen it. You would have understood, you would have interpreted it better. And today, we have technology. Those days, we did not have cloud. We did not have, you know, the mobile communication as robust and efficient as this. But today we have. But are we embarrassing? Are we doing something to embarrass this? Are we, as a healthcare company, building this out for, for the customers to use it? And building it, out, building it out is one. And are we able to make them adopt this is another. So that's clearly one thing. And how we are going to not just look at a care area view. A care area view is if I have a heart problem, I go to a cardiology department, and within the cardiology department, they will look out for my heart and they take care of my heart. Is that the way healthcare has to be delivered, or it has to be more driven by a care cycle view? A care cycle view starts with the patient because it's all about us. It starts with us and how early I can be screened how quickly I can, under, effectively I can make a diagnosis and how I can treat early. And all of this will bring down cost of healthcare. And I said, a digital platform is core. A digital platform is core to connect all of this because these are not all available at the same place everywhere. Yes, in some places it is available and in those places it's very expensive. So now if you have to bring down cost, you have to bring efficiency and efficiency can happen through uh, digital platforms, the efficiency can happen through business model innovations, adoption. Adoption rates can only become better if we have a business model innovation. I'll share with you a few of the examples. And uh, fundamentally, it's all about you know, broad-basing affordable health care. And broad-basing affordable health care is not at all possible without expanding technology access. It's about expanding not just reach, is about exp expanding technology access, availability, and you know supporting uh, by connecting the entire ecosystem is the way forward. So now, how are we doing this? The last three, four years have been very interesting. Uh, my prior to that, 15 years serving in G Healthcare and even before in Philips, uh, you know, yes, we were, you know, selling technology. We were bringing in uh, equipment into India made anywhere in the world, and we were marketing it. We were uh, making the first inroads, uh, you know, to enable adoption of technology to, to, you know, to be able to intervene better and to improve the outcomes. But the last three, four years, what we have done is significant. It's very significant because we have taken the mantle of also, you know, connecting healthcare. We have uh, GE as a company, or most of the big healthcare uh, diagnostic healthcare companies have products more aligned to diagnosis and treatment. And especially in India, because our mindset itself is treatment mindset, and only uh, the diagnosis companies and treatment companies are popular here. There are phenomenal screening technologies available in the world. They don't even look at us as a market because they think that, you know, who will pay for screening here? versus obviously we will find a way of paying for treatment or we'll find a way of paying for uh, you know diagnosis. Uh, insurance companies support, government schemes support, but who will pay for screening? There is no insurance company or no government or you know, it has to be out of pocket. So who's going to do that? And especially screening is at a time when you don't, you don't seem to have a problem. When we, seem to, when we don't have a problem, we assume that we are healthy. And that's where the, all the problem starts. So that's where we uh, made the effort uh, to complement the robust portfolio that we have from GE uh, in diagnosis and treatments. And to make it more efficient, we brought in uh, complementing technologies in screening. And I will share with you two significant things uh, which we could accomplish through that. Of course, a lot more uh, you know, is being done, but I can share with you, with the interest of time, uh, I will share with you two very interesting facts. You know, we partnered a year back with, first of all, uh, we built a connected tele-ECG solution. And having been impacted by ECG myself, you know, the first thing we did 
uh, was to build a tele-ECG network. And how did we build this? No, G Healthcare has ECG equipments. They are one of the best in class ECG equipments in the world, which is known for you know, its accuracy and the early diagnosis. But an ECG machine is only an ECG machine. It can throw reports, but who will interpret this? And do we have specialists uh, you know, uh, across the country available 24 by 7 you know, to interpret this? We don't. So we decided to partner with a, a large uh, cardiologist network uh, who would read the ECG for us. And uh, we connected the, our ECG machines to this central hub. And uh, you know, through, through which within five minutes, we train a paramedical to just place the lead. I'm sure some, uh, most of you, if you have gone through an ECG test, you would know that it's all about placing leads and uh, acquiring the electrical signals of the heart and interpreting them. So a paramedical can be trained to place the leads. And then all that he, she, he or she needs to do is to press the button. Uh, the ECG is transmitted through the cloud to the hub center, which is interpreting this. And within five minutes, uh, the report goes back. It's just not the report going back. It's also about if the ECG is abnormal, you know, the hub center takes the responsibility to call back the client anywhere in the country. We have got this connection going. The hub center is in Bangalore. And uh, you know, we have you know, installations in Northeast, you know, where at any point of day, 24 by 7, if, uh, with an inter thankfully with the availability of internet everywhere, uh, you know, they can connect and uh, here we can interpret. And if there is a problem in the ECG, somebody will call and tell the paramedical staff or the duty doctor you know, to stabilize the patient and also find the nearest large hospital from where an ambulance can be sent and the patient can be pulled in you know, for intervention, early intervention, leveraging the gold hour. If it's an acute emergency, golden hour determines success rates. It's not even about how good the doctor is or how good the hospital is. How early you intervene determines that, and we are able to do that. And now, this is not only for the remote northeast. You know, we found value for this in our town, in our, in our city. You know, we partnered with uh, Apollo Hospitals. Now, Apollo Hospitals for long, you know, was excelling in cardiac treatment. And they, mo they changed their vision from being the best in class in treatment to be preventing their new slogan. I'm sure if you see the billion heart beating, you know, they're talking about prevention. And when we saw them realigning themselves to prevent an event and not just treat, obviously they are already equipped to treat. So now to prevent when they want removed their focus, we went to them and we said that we have the solution and we can do a pilot with you. And I'll share with you this pilot results. For the last one, uh, one year, uh, we started the discussion. Last six months, we have been piloting with them. We did about uh, 7,700 uh, ECGs, you know, uh, where the hub hospital in Chennai or Hyderabad, you know, would, you know, we will install the ECGs in the neighborhood, in the physician offices and in the uh, small clinics. And the patients who go there uh, for the routine checkup or with a problem, quickly an ECG is done. Uh, Apollo Hospital created a hard command center because they wanted to you know, uh, take the responsibility of interpreting for their own patients. So they created the hub by themselves. In fact, it was inaugurated uh, yesterday by uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy you know, in Hyderabad. And uh, through this, uh, you know, the pilot phase, uh, before they uh, agreed to you know, take it to the customers, we did about 7,000 patients, about 709 patients were critical. And uh, you know, abnormal was about 58 patients who needed immediate, immediate intervention. But this is not just the fact where we could intervene early in the golden hour and you know, they could quickly you know, bring the patient, send the ambulance and bring the patient to the nearby hospital, their main hospital to provide care. It's, look at the number of, uh, we had about 30% of these you know, who were uh, you know, seen early, who did not need immediate treatment, but certainly needed the next level of diagnosis, which is an echo or a treadmill test, you know, which uh, you know, they had to go through. 
and through that diagnosing early you are able to you know predict early and avoid the treatment or avoid the you know the uh, you know risk rates associated with uh, you know a post you know complication you know intervention so this was a significant move and apollo hospitals has already around the country installed about 100 such they want to all the way go up to 5000 uh, looking at how this will work this is the social cost they are not going to charge for these ecgs but obviously as the treatment provider you know they are able to intervene early and live up to their motto of wanting to be responsible for prevention and thereby reducing cost of echo and as a company ge had products other companies do have products but we created this ecosystem we created this connect and through this we are able to bring in a change and of course this is now i'm just talking about one big example but this is now getting very popular and i'm sure you know the adoption rates will accelerate as people see the efficiency of this really able to connect the patient the physician the treatment center and all of them efficiently to reduce cost of health care there is another very interesting example i'm not, most of us uh, who are married um, have babies i don't know how many of you know that it's very important within the first 7 days of your baby's birth to check for uh, hearing ability of the baby uh, it's not very it's it's mandated by world health organization that every baby born has to be screened within 7 days it's a standard of care anywhere else i'm sure in the uk and the us and everywhere uh, and in india <coughs> it's been a lot of push from the government nrhm is you know uh, making it a uh, mandate but adoption rates are very very poor why it's it's not because the test is expensive it's not because we don't know the importance of this you know it's a very very important test when we talk about screening early intervention it's a very very important test because the baby you know is able to learn language brain development is only going and speech all of this are basis what he or she hears the more you delay if the baby has got a hearing defect and you will be surprised five out of 1000 babies in india are born with hearing defect it's a lot, large population if you miss that if you if, it's a very simple device you need to put a ear ear plug you know which uh, which which transmits a sound and uh, take reflex back sound and uh, in 2 minutes the test is over it's a pass or a refer okay if it's a pass the baby is okay if it's a refer it has to be referred for diagnostics and for intervention and the more you delay this and if you don't do it before 3 or 4 years or even 5 years the more you delay this there is if it's total hearing as early as possible if it's partial hearing defect there can be an infection or there can be some condition which can be treated the more you delay this the learning ability the ability to speak all of this is going to get affected brain development is going to get affected and it is irretrievable and beyond a point whatever you do to intervene you know it the baby will grow in the normal course but you know impaired by brain development and you know it's a big burden the baby itself is a burden you know it's a big problem for the baby itself why would it have to go through that for no fault when there is a technology available so now government in india and many state governments are rapidly wanting to adopt this and uh, one of the progressive state governments that we have uh, you know is the tamil nadu government you know which about a year back decided to mandate it for all babies uh, karnataka has also mandated it uh, they have done it even one step uh, you know in a, with a with a uh, with a foresight of before school every baby will have to be screened if you missed at birth at least before school you need to have your baby screened you know so that you know you can intervene early so what we did here we imported the screening technology we brought this to the country and uh, we partnered with uh, treatment organizations like in chennai there is a treatment organization called muff there are private hospitals like cloud 9 and so on and so forth here in bangalore you know apollos of the world who buy the equipment and to provide the service but when it has to go to a larger base of population 
babies who are born in the uh, government hospitals and who may not have access to this. You know, this is where government comes into play. They mandate this service, and we do a private public partnership mode, whereas we partner with the treatment provider uh, who's go who will do the screening and also treat the baby, you know, if it's found to be having a hearing problem. So here we, and we continuously partner with government, with NGO organizations as Rotary Club, uh, you know, to be funding this because, again, somebody needs to fund all this, even if the cost of tests being smaller. But from our perspective, just, but we don't just sell to the ones who want to buy, but we also make sure that we do a private-private partnership where on a pay-per-use basis for every, every test done, a small amount of money is paid back to us. Uh, you know, so that you know, this can be broad-based. Because if you want everyone to buy, it's going to take a lot of time. If you want everyone to be able to use this, train their manpower and use this machine, it's going to take longer time. But the problem already is, is there. And with this problem, if you have to quickly intervene, we have to disrupt. And one of our dis disruption is through the commercial enablement uh, by moving away from transaction selling model to paper use models, which is expanding access. So now, clearly when we screen early, our ability to diagnose early happens, and certainly the treatment becomes better. And now, quickly I will close with this slide on Ashman and Bharat. This is a great effort by the government of India. Of course, uh, very early in adoption stage, just launched uh, last week. Uh, of course, you know, the uh, reimbursements apparently are not to the expectation of the hospitals and the doctors. But oh, those things will evolve. And uh, my belief is if you make it more efficient, uh, think, you know, the cost will come down. And if cost comes down, reimbursement does not become a factor. So what is Ashman Bharat? I'm sure most of you know this. It's about expanding uh, you know, access to more people for healthcare. It's the first step in you know, government's first step by government to expand, uh, to move towards democratization of healthcare. 10 crore more families are going to come in. A lot of states have empaneled, and they have combined their existing state programs along with this. And now, what they do very well about this is, you know, they are going back, re-emphasizing primary health care focus. Ashman Bharat is two things. One is, at a primary health care level, can we do screening? Uh, you know, like Tamil Nadu government does 25 screening parameters. Uh, and, you know, the Ashman Bharat program uh, mandates cancer screening for women, oral, cervical, and breast. For all women more than 30 years of age, you know, they have to be screened for cervical, uh, cervical uh, cancer or uh, breast cancer or oral cancer. For hypertension uh, is one of the areas where your ECG and your uh, you know, blood sugar levels and cholesterol levels, levels are being screened. And apart from this, there's a lot more screening tests that are available you know, at the primary health care center level itself. Now, it's, is it available in all the states? Definitely not. Why? Because just by government, they can only go that much. But we need to come in as private providers, which is hospitals who treat. And that's one of the things that they are including. You know, they're asking hospitals to take ownership of running the primary health care centers because the treatment is, be, is going to be provided by them. So it will be a, a good opportunity to connect that system of primary health care system where it's already available. The infrastructure is available by the government. Technology companies like us can certainly play a role in partnering, not just in transacting, but in partnering with the models of PPP. And the private providers can come in there, bring in the staff, train the staff. And through the technology that we have, uh, through which we liquefy expertise, we can connect, you know, uh, you know, those, you know, d uh, we can create hub centers like what Apollo has created, you know, to get those ECGs from those primary health care centers, read it, intervene early, and be more efficient and effective about health care. So for all of this, uh, I'm glad that, you know, when three, four years back or ten years back when G decided to come in India and look at health care for all, we didn't visualize government coming in as strong. We were actually want, thinking that uh, private is going to take the lead. And private is the, is the place mostly which takes the burden of health care delivery in our country. But now with this government, com government program coming in, we are glad that we are ready. We are there in every district, about 400 districts we are present. We have already created a digital backbone. We have, you know, 
deployment models as what I shared with you. And uh, we're continuing to evolve this to rapidly integrate with the common program. We are even quickly, I mean, we are creating an IT app, uh, you know, which will, IT enabled app, which will allow uh, the health records to be available everywhere. Because thankfully, Ashman Bharat is not about a program that will only be covered in Karnataka. You know, if I'm a patient in Karnataka, if I go to Delhi, and if I have a problem, I can walk into a hospital which is impaneled here, and uh, you know, my records will be available as well. A lot of IT involvement you know, is being mandated by the government in all of this. So truly, you know, this has been a very enriching experience. I'm glad that you know, with, the, with, the, with the experience that you know, uh, GE brings in, and all of us bring in through our personal experiences as well. You know, uh, we are trying to truly embarrass dis uh, disruption. And uh, embarrassing disruption, I believe, totally is the first step towards doing something very big. And democratization of healthcare is a big move. And uh, the reason I had to take examples to explain this is because most of you, you know, I'm sure you know, know about this. But then when we put all this together, it will give you a you know, complete view of you know, what we ourselves are responsible for when it comes to our own healthcare, and what we can tell our friends through the knowledge that we have, and what we can do as technology companies, and what we can uh, you know, enable as adoption rates in those hospitals, you know, and also the partnership with governments to be able to truly achieve our goal of healthcare for all, which is universal healthcare. So this is all that uh, I have from me. And uh, our belief in GenWorks is quality healthcare at affordable levels is only possible through access, improving access, which we discussed, and bringing in uh, relevant technology at the point of care and liquefying expertise. Because all these are the problems that we have to bring together to solve the problem. Otherwise, we'll just be creating problems. No, I, one thing I always believe is tech, from coming from the technology background, uh, technology in any form should only solve a problem for it to merit, for it to be merited. It cannot create a problem. Technology as a, can create problems if you don't connect it you know, to the delivery and take accountability for the delivery. And accountability of the delivery can only happen if we connect the ecosystem and finally look at the patient. Finally, look at the public who's getting that delivery of health care, who's getting the treatment, and are they able to get it effectively and efficiently is the way forward. So that's all from me.